Masa Yoshi son of SoftBank is a name we are all familiar with. He has endorsed the largest win, Alibaba, and the largest loss, WeWork, in venture capital history. Asked about his style, he once admitted, I don't look for companies, I look for founders. Hello everyone, I'm Ramesh Dhamani, welcoming you to another episode of Wizards of the Street. With me today, I'm happy to say, is someone not only from my own alma mater, Cathedral School in Mumbai, but also a double master's degree holder from Stanford. He runs a new age investment firm, Convergent Finance. What does he look for when investing? Let's listen in and meet the managing partner of Convergent Finance, Harsha Raghavan. Harsha, welcome to Wizards. Thank you so much, Ramesh. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Harsha. Harsha, you have a very impressive uh, educational background. Cathedral, Berkeley, Stanford, Stanford. Uh, what did you learn? What part of your education was so helpful to you? Ramesh, that's an interesting question. I studied, uh, I got degrees in computer science, economics, um, a master's degrees in industrial engineering, and then uh, business as well. I studied a, lot, a number of subjects, physics, chemistry, um, astronomy, psychology. Really? And the range of all those subjects that I studied and taking an interest in, in, in so many areas, I feel has made me a much better, well-rounded investment professional. You know, Charlie Munger often calls the importance of multidisciplinary uh, background. So I guess you clearly have that. Uh, Arja, you've also met some of the stalwarts of the industry, Deepak Parekh, Prem Vatsa. Uh, who has influenced you? Can you give me an example in your leadership uh, that has helped you become the leader you have with them? Right from the beginning of my career, I've been blessed with really good mentors. You're right, Deepak Parekh has been uh, an amazing mentor for me for my career. Prem, uh, Deepak introduced me to Prem many years ago, and Prem has turned out to be a real uh, blessing as a mentor as well. What I have learned, and others too, from my Goldman Sachs days and from my, uh, the beginning of my career, what I've learned from many of the best is two key things. The first is the power of empathy. Great leaders also are human beings, family members, friends, uh, personal friends, and so the power of empathy is something that uh, I've seen as a consistent trend among my mentors. Steve Jobs was a dictator, not necessarily empathetic, but yet he was a great leader. Yes, you're right, and everyone has a different style. The mentors that I, I've had did not include Steve, unfortunately, but had uh, some of the others. The second thing, which I suppose perhaps Steve did have, the ability to zoom out and then zoom way into the details and take that big picture view, but also get really into the micro. And that's something, again, that I learned from both Prem and Deepak and others, and that has stood me in good stead in my career. You know, you talk about uh, your extensive uh, work experience before you started with Fairfax also. Uh, can you tell me some incident in your early uh, work experience that helped you become a better leader or a better manager like you are today? Oh, that's an easy one. Right at the beginning of my career, in 1996, uh, I joined an investment fund, a private equity fund here in Mumbai, uh, long before the career, the, 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 the industry was sort of recognized here in India. And we did a buyout of a BIFR bankrupt paper mill uh, called Sri Rayalseema Paper Mills, right in the middle of Andhra Pradesh. It was my first job and it was my first investment. It was a major investment, buyout of a paper mill, trying to rehabilitate uh, a, a mothballed asset with 3,000 unpaid laborers. I was tossed in literally into the deep end of the pool. I, had, I was give, given the role of the acting CFO. I'd never been any kind of CFO. And I, uh, I had to sit there and try and make it work. We unfortunately did not succeed with that investment. But the learning that I had of how to deal with tough situations, I think has held me in good stead. Trial by fire, as they say. Uh, Harsha, you've written a piece where you said uh, 1918 was a Spanish flu and that gave way to the Roaring Twenties. Yes. 100 years later, we're going through a similar phase. What will the next 30 years bring for the world and for India? That's an interesting question, one of those great imponderables, and I hope we get to chat about this again 20 years from now. OECD tells us that India right now has a $3 trillion GDP, which is about 3% of global, 95 trillion is the global GDP. OECD tells us that this is going to expand to 33 trillion by 2050. At which point, global GDP will be about 200. So we're gonna go from 3% of global GDP 
according to OECD, to 16%. Now, it's not a coincidence, but uh, we, we are one-sixth of the world's population today. By 2050, we'll be a larger percentage of the world's population. So if we are even close to uh, OECD, OECD's prediction, we will be a major global financial center, import and consumption center, export and production center. And we'll, uh, India will really be on the world stage at that point. You know, you're painting a very bullish picture for the Indian economy, and that, of course, warms my heart. But uh, let's see what will get us there. Uh, there's a lot of talk of the digital India or the India stack as helping us get to that 30 trillion uh, output that you mentioned. How important is that in your view? The government of India, um, starting over a decade ago with um, the great contributions of Nandan Nilakani and uh, the prior government and then continuing on, we have embraced technology and the government of India looks at technology as an infrastructure enabler. As a game changer for India. Absolutely. And so it started with Aadhaar, uh, it's gone on with UPI. And Jandan. And Jandan, absolutely. We now have ONDC coming on. Now, UPI transactions in the month of October, last month, just hit 7 billion transactions for the month. This is something that six years ago did not exist. And so when every Indian is transacting five times a month, man, woman, and child, and as a result, we're uh, doing something like $140 billion per month in UPI transactions. This in creates efficiency. This is obviously not a parallel economy. This is a, uh, a well-understood economy. And I think that means that friction costs, ease of doing business come down. You may, you written a lovely piece also in your site called, uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, Schrodinger's Cat or the Indian Paradox. Uh, Explain what you mean by Schrodinger's cat and the paradox. Owen Schrodinger was one of uh, Albert Einstein's um, sparring partners. Yes, and debate partners. Yes, and uh, they had a puzzle that they wanted to solve, which is if there's a cat that is both alive and dead at the same time, then how can that be possible? And if he's in a box, you wouldn't know if he was alive or dead, I think. Exactly. If he's in the box, how would you know whether he's alive or dead? So they... They ended up, after debating back and forth, they ended up concluding that he must be both alive and dead. And uh, so, so that's, that's the uh, paradox. That's the paradox. Now, in our world, with the, all the information we have around us, I sit and try to reconcile uh, some of the paradoxes that I see around me. For example, we've had moments where our stock market has been on fire. Sensex has gone up 50% uh, or since the COVID times. COVID, yes. Number of billionaires have gone up. Absolutely, in 140 in India today. So the stock market and number of billionaires has, has been at all-time highs. The fundamentals of the economy, with a lot of um, pain and suffering by the common man, is one element of a paradox. We have investments, equity investments. The IPO markets have had their best years ever, FDI. Equity investments have been at all-time highs as well. Um, yet, yet, asset creation has been um, perhaps a little bit less. Why has asset creation made less? Uh despite so much investment in the economy? Part of the reason is that some of the IPOs in recent years have been of the asset light businesses. Uh, with these asset light businesses, there's been sale of shares, which doesn't actually result in uh, increasing the, the coffers of the companies and doesn't result in... It's paid to exit the businesses, the original That's right. investors. That's right. Okay. That's right. But uh, these are all paradoxes that I haven't fully figured out. Liquidity as well um, has been another... Uh, paradox for me because we've seen a lot of liquidity in the system yet lack of credit uptake and so that again makes one wonder why why would that be when the banks are flush with capital? But you, you've also mentioned that the movement from the unorganized or the mom and pop economy to the formal economy uh, involves a period of stress and uh, you know bad performance for a while doesn't it it does you know and one of the key um, trends that I, I see in India is that we're moving from a sort of so-called mom and pop and fragmented economy towards a more consolidated one. That, unfortunately, does mean there will be winners, a few, and maybe some of the smaller businesses or subscale businesses may not end up being winners. And so there may be uh, those who need to retool themselves and move on. In your article, you talk about uh, the Industrial Revolution in England and saying how in the short term it was a negative, but in the long term it improved standards of living, standards of health, and created more prosperity. 
Are we on a similar cusp? We are. I do believe so. Um, we now have a situation where the BPO industry, the IT services industry, is going deeper into our hinterland. And we have smaller cities across the India where whether it's foreign companies or Indian companies are setting up big centers and hiring people. Um, it's, again, maybe ironic, but then security cameras need to be monitored. Some of that activity, effectively a security guard, some of that activity is no longer economical to be done in a Western nation. So we may have situations here in India, in our hinterland, where there's an Indian with an American accent saying to a guy in Kentucky, hey, buddy, get off my lawn. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've heard about those things. Uh, you, you, the morning's newspaper uh, suggested that Indian exports have fallen and imports have risen. Uh, yet there's a dream from Delhi and a dream from a lot of analysts who say that India will become the next export powerhouse. How realistic is that ambition? Well, uh, that's a great question. We've gone from sub-500 billion of exports pre-COVID to now something ab above 700 billion. It's more than 40% increase in exports in just a COVID period. But it fell last month. It, monthly data, monthly data uh, I think, can, can tell... Can, smoothen out. Can smoothen out, yes. The long-term trend, I'd say, is exports are going up. There's also an element to this which is in, important. The world used to be dependent on physical goods, manufactured physical goods. That's not changing. However, there is an increasing shift towards a dependency on services, particularly digitally delivered services. India is very well positioned for that. And so our services industries, IT, BPO, KPO, etc., have already done super well. But we're just at the beginning of that journey as well, where our services industry will be offered an increasing scale to the world. Harsha, thank you for insight. We'll take a break, come back and chat some more with Harsha on Wizards of the Street. And welcome back to Wizards of the Street. I'm Ramesh Damani. We are chatting with Harsha Raghavan. A lot of people say India is a time that has come. Uh, it's not China plus one, but it's now India. How do you stand on that? Are you as bullish as the voices on the street? Well, um, we have a fund focused on Indian uh, investments. And um, we have lots of good international investors who, um, who believe that story and actually believe that it's a story that is not temporal in nature. It's actually uh, long-term and structural to the way the world is shifting. So that's why we make investments a bit like um, some of my men uh, mentors and role models like Prem Watson and Warren Buffett. We make investments that we actually think about as being long-term keepers. Uh, that gives me a great segue. I mean, I read your bio and you don't want to invest for five years or 10 years, but almost for a generation, 20 years, 30 years. So let's start with picking your brains. You always said that you like platform companies. What do you mean by platform company? Platform companies are ones where they're good companies in good industries, but also with strong management and capitalization, such that they can help consolidate an industry. I've seen this happen many times in my career with companies we've been participating in, contract manufacturing with Hindustan Foods, staffing servicing services with Quest Corporation, where they are scaling at 10x, 20x, 50x, which their industry is not, because they're consolidating that industry, and therefore creating scale, efficiency, and providing very valuable services uh, to their ecosystem partners. Okay, so basically a platform company should be able to consolidate and scale uh, yes. his business. What is your investment hypothesis? You, how many pitches do you see in a year for investments from your fund? We see between 400 and 500 per year. And how many will you pick out of those? Two to three. Two, three, that's it, out of 500? Yeah. So what is your investment hypothesis? What are you looking for? What, is, what can a promoter say to impress you? It's four things. It's four things. In any meeting, I'm looking for just four things. Good industry, good company, good management, and the key three qualities that uh, Buffett talks about, which is intelligence, energy, integrity. and integrity. Uh, and then a, a reasonable entry valuation that allows us to uh, capture upside. If you get those four things right, the industry, the company, the management, and the valuation, then we're sold. 
Raghav, uh, Harsha, it's still easier said than done. Uh, you see 500 companies. Uh, give me an example, at least, where you've been able to distinguish a long-term winner from a business that flopped. And what is it a gut feel that gets you into these companies? Is it uh, hard data that gets you into the company? Is it a talk with the promoters? Masayoshi Son said, I look for uh, pr founders, I don't look for companies. Yes, well, we uh, certainly look for founders and companies. Um, we look for founders, therefore, management teams and companies. If the first meeting goes well, 90% of uh, meetings will end with a with a cup of coffee and uh, nice to see you. And a handshake. And a handshake. Really? 90% yeah. you will st uh, yeah, kill, kill on day you. one. Huh? But the next 10%, which is still 40 to 50 companies, we will then undertake a rigorous due diligence. Ask for a, a, a good amount of data, um, do a look at public information, and uh, as much as we can, cross-question, in order to then filter through 40 to 50 to the eventual two or three. The 90% that you have a cup of coffee and handshake, what do you see in them that you re reject them? It's, it could be it, the, the first... Not a scalable a, business, for example, or...? Not a scalable business could easily be one. The return on capital metrics of the company being uh, not, uh, not something that uh, meets our standards. Management teams that we think are good but not great could be another reason. Uh, so, so yeah, there are several, several things, uh, elements that uh, go into play. Okay, let's flip it and let's say the 10% that you see. What is the gleam in your eye? Is it generally a promoter who's passionate about his work? Is it a business? In fact, what do you find more important, great businesses or great business leaders? What's more important to you? That's a great question. And, and you're, you're asking all the right questions because these trade-offs need to get made in order to reach to uh, a determination. Business leaders who are great can stand the test of time. Through up cycles and through down cycles, those great business leaders will engender loyalty and stability to uh, allow their companies to, to perform. So I would say finding good business leaders is priority number one. Uh, as opposed to a great business, a business leader can yes. make a... Yes. Though, of course, it's the contrary to what Warren Buffett, someone you admire, says. He always says that uh, you can't change the economics of a lousy business, no matter how great a... Uh, manager you are. Yes, 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 and uh, in, 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 the, in the U.S. context, that's probably uh, true with, uh, with his op opportunity set. Here in India, where there's so much opportunity and our economy is growing at this rate, I'd say even some of the less promising businesses relative to others, under good management, can consolidate those industries and still create amazing returns. Uh, you know, speaking of visiting promoters, consolidating businesses, I know you've had almost 20 years experience now with Fairfax and uh, with your own fund, Convergent Finance. Take me historically through uh, a business that you seeded and see it grow up and just talk me through the history of that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, great, um, that's a great one. In 2011, we had invested into a small private company, uh, which was at that time called IKEA, I-K-Y-A, run by a person who I'd known from the past already. Um, uh, a superb entrepreneur by the name of Ajit Isaac. With Ajit, we bought 74% of the business. With Ajit, we rebranded the company, uh, called it Quest, Quest Corporation. Yes, of course, yeah. um, it's a staffing services business. At that time, they just had 25 or 30,000 people, one of many that had uh, staffing services in some city or location around the country, maybe undifferentiated. But with Ajit, I saw something different in an industry that had no respect at all. And I saw that Ajit had what it took to turn this industry and create a, a national champion, a leader. So we've, with Ajit, we were able to undertake approximately 16 acquisitions, scale the business from 30,000 to half a million people, national, and become a strategic partner to Amazon and some of the other big names, and then IPO the business. And um, I think uh, the rest is history. Today is, of course, a very successful listed company, Quest Corporation. Uh, Two people with strong framework for ethics have been your mentors or bosses, you know, yes. Prem Watsa and Deepak Parik. Talk to me a little bit about them. How, I mean, first of all, uh, I think Deepak introduced you to Prem. Watsa, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what you've learned from them or how they've influenced you. So uh, they are, first and foremost, friends, individuals that I can relate with. No distance at all. 
And um, that's something that I've found is, is one of the most powerful skills of a leader. You brought up the example of Steve Jobs, um, who I never had a, the opportunity to meet. But certainly, I have, seen, I, have, I have seen tyrants who may be able to get some things done uh, on their own, but don't create true leadership and loyalty. With Prem and Deepak, it's the opposite. They are gems as human beings, number one. But number two, they're also very smart. Big picture thinkers who are able to, in the case of Deepak over 50 years, in the case of Prem over 40 years, build large, big, successful organizations, such as HDFC and Fairfax, and yet remain grounded and humble and into the details. Absolutely, and compounded money over long periods of time. Among your new investing companies, really quickly, is there anything that uh, you invest, of course, in both listed space and unlisted space? For our viewers in the listed space, can you talk about anything that you've invested in recently? Yes, we invested um, recently in a company called Jackson Pal Pharma. They are a pharmaceutical marketing company. They have their own brands, and um, they've been uh, Delhi-based, publicly listed for um, 40 years. But the, manage the, the family there wanted to hand over the management. So we partnered with Manish Gupta, a fantastic uh, industry He's the veteran. MD now of the company. Yes, yeah. and he's now the MD of the company. And we are now helping take that legacy of Jackson Power Pharma and build it into uh, the next national champion. So your heart is still in the 30, 40 year investments, not in the double your money, get out business. Oh no, no. The opportunity set in India, there's opportunity for everyone. And some traders I think can make good money by doubling and tripling and then exiting. For us, we're business builders. Business builders, of course. Well, you're also going to do a rapid fire for me. So let me just end this on a lighter note and give you a rapid fire letter, list of questions. If you're an Indian graduate today, would you recommend an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad or your alma mater, Stanford? I'd pick Stanford. Okay. Would you rather have drinks with Masa Yushi Son or Mark Anderson, both VCs? I'd go with Masa. Okay. An investment book that you would recommend? Extraordinary Popular Delusions. John McKay's. By Charles McKay. Yes, of course. Charles McKay, I'm sorry. The best newspaper magazine to read for financial graduates? The Economist. Always, huh? The best promoter entrepreneur that you have met in your career? I'd have to go with Samir Kothari, Hindustan Foods. Really? The contract manufacturer yes. for Pepsi, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, fill in the blank with whatever you feel like. By 2050, India is destined to be a dash. Global financial center. All right. Fill in the blank. The recent tech meltdown in the USA has taught me? It was inevitable. Okay. Fill in the blank. Prem Vatsa has taught me? Empathy. All right. Between Silicon Valley, Shanghai, or Bangalore, the more exciting place over the next five years? I have to say Bangalore. Okay. Uh, is the era of globalization behind us, yes or no? Oh, no. Okay. A mega trend that you foresee? I think the world is going to become um, energy surplus through renewables. Really? Yeah. Uh, at a time of energy crisis, you're talking energy surplus. That truly is a mega trend. A CAGR rate for your investing companies, that makes you happy? More is better, but at least 30%, please. 30% is a fabulous uh, rate of return. You know, there's an old English philosopher, Francis Bacon, who said, a wise man will make more opportunities than he finds. Harsha, you've clearly done that. Well, thank you so much, Ramesh. It's great to chat. Thank you so much for being on our show, Harsha. And we'll see you next week on another episode of The Wizards of the Street. Thank you for joining us today.